The rolling hills of Ireland have been home to many cherished traditions. The poetry of great writers, a rich musical legacy, the warmth of the corner pub. But there's another Irish tradition that has found a home in America. A game of skill, speed, and strategy called handball. It's a game whose history goes back thousands of years. It's been played against the ruins of ancient Irish castles, behind bar rooms during the gold rush days of San Francisco, and on the concrete playgrounds of New York City. You just go in there with your bare hands and one other person, and pretty much anything goes. A blend of power and speed, and form and grace of complex strategy and lightning quick reflexes. That's handball. It's a physical conversation, you know, I mean, it, you probe the weaknesses and then you attack. Players going toe to toe, matching skills one on one, going at it anywhere a wall and a flat patch of ground come together. That too is handball. They could play up against any kind of wall. Garage walls, convent walls, castle walls. But there's a wall, there's a way. Handball has a long and colorful history in America. And although the best handball players are the equal of the finest athletes in the country, very few can expect to sign endorsement contracts, nor are they likely to become wealthy from the game. Handball became a popular sport because of the challenge, the thrill, and the sheer fun of chasing and hitting a ball while trying to outthink your opponent. You know, it's just a great feeling. You play a great match and you you know, you, you go home and you get a sh bite to eat or something and that match stays with you. You know, you think about it all evening and a lot of times I'll, it puts me to sleep. You know, I'll lay in bed and I'll think about the match and go right out. The basics of handball are extremely simple and straightforward. Hit a ball on the fly against a front wall to your opponent who must then return it to the front wall before it bounces twice. But those basic rules are deceptive. The actual game is full of twists, turns, and complexity. In the same way, the history of handball is deceiving. What appears to be a simple game that can be played anywhere turns out to be a sport with roots stretching back more than 4,000 years. I think we have to go back to the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans. And the, it's depicted in some of the Egyptian tombs. Homer also mentions ball games uh, be, to be, be among virgins. Now, it's not a condition for playing handball nowadays, but uh, at that time, Homer indicated that Achilles visited a, a number of cities and saw the ladies playing handball, seemingly just throwing the ball back and forth. It wasn't actually a, a game as we know it. And while ancient Europeans played an early form of handball, the Aztecs and Mayans of Central America invented ball games that required a slap of the hand to drive the ball. However, many of these early ball games did not make use of a wall. Historian Tom O'Connor believes this was an Irish invention that then spread elsewhere and took on different names. Handball has been a part of Irish history since at least the 15th century, thanks in part to the ancient stone castles and monasteries that provided a convenient surface for players to hit the ball against. And to this day, outdoor handball courts dot the countryside, many standing just a stone's throw from some of Ireland's ancient cathedrals and monuments. Over the centuries, it's the Irish who have preserved and refined the game of handball, making it a part of their national culture.
It's a sound that once echoed throughout the Irish countryside. The unmistakable sound of the alley cracker, ringing off the thick stone surface of a handball alley. In Ireland now, the first mention of the game was 1427, the Statute of Galway, a set of laws that regulated the behaviour of the, the native Irish under the English oppression. And one thing they indicated that they couldn't play handball against the walls of the city. Second thing, of course, is that no one with a name beginning with O or Mac could be in the city after dusk. Despite the ban, the game of handball took root in Ireland, in places like County Clare and County Kilkenny. It was played wherever a proper wall was available. In fact, it was the church and other landowners that built many of these courts to keep the locals from banging up the castles and cathedrals in the center of town. Handball courts were by and large developed by landlords as a way of providing some sporting activity for their farm laborers. And quite a few of the landlords themselves became immersed in the game. The handball court at the time was a large three-walled edifice. It worked as a place to play handball it also worked as the local dance hall, um, everything. And there are stories told of Tungraney where when the playing during the day was over, the dances were held in the court at night using bicycle lamps hung on the wall. In Ireland, the game was sport. It was social cement. And it was big time entertainment. There is no place on earth where handball is more deeply embedded in the national psyche. This court was built into a graveyard in the village of Yogalara in County Tipperary more than two centuries ago. You play the traditional Irish version of the game on a court that measures 30 by 60, and you play it with what the Irish call the hardball, otherwise known as the alley cracker. This is the original alley cracker, so called from its distinctive cracking sound when you killed this ball at the bottom of the front wall, or as we said in Ireland for centuries, you dead butted this ball. Now I'm going to cut into it just to show you what it's made from. It starts off with a little piece of hazel wood in the core of the hairball, then it's surrounded with pieces of rubber band thread, all sorts of woolen thread and bits and pieces like that, all wound together into a, a nice round ball, covered on the outside with goat skin, genuine goat skin. And, you know, when you get a fresh hairball even, you could even smell the goat. So that's what your hairball consists of. It should come as no surprise that Peter McGee knows the traditional hardball game inside and out. He holds a record 10 national championships in hardball plus a few national championships in the modern softball game. Of the two, there was no question which one he thought was the tougher challenge. Because you must remember in the old days, we had the best of seven frames to play. In other words, you had to win four out of seven in a big court like this with a hard ball. And that was a tough game. Always after a handball match, I mean, there was no such thing as enemies in the olden days. You must remember we traveled maybe 200 miles to play a match. And when the match was over, we all retired to the pub. That was part of the tradition. And we didn't worry about drinking and driving in them days. The friendship and camaraderie enjoyed by handball players is well known throughout the world. There's a mutual bond of appreciation, of knowing what the challenge of the game is all about. The hospitality to which visiting handball players are treated is the stuff of legend. In today's Ireland, the traditional hardball game has given way to the modern game of 20 by 40 softball. But the spirit of that tradition is still passed on to each new generation in the public schools, where handball is a strong part of the sports program. The Irish have also passed on their love of handball to a relatively new territory, for it's the Irish who are credited with bringing the game to America.
The arrival of Irish pioneers during the 1849 California Gold Rush gave birth to America's first documented handball courts. Thomas Cullen's Saloon and Ball Alley on San Francisco's Market Street boasted a court attached to the rear of the pub. Historians write that Abraham Lincoln was fond of the game. Lincoln's law partner claimed the future president was an excellent player whose large hands and fast feet were well suited to handball. By the 1880s, the game of handball had taken hold in San Francisco. Championship matches would fill the galleries with capacity crowds, many of whom would place large wagers on their favorite players. The great silent film comedian Harold Lloyd was so enamored with the game that he had handball courts built at his studio and at his Beverly Hills estate. He often hosted exhibition matches for Hollywood's elite. It was at one of these events that Lloyd brought in a young man from San Francisco who had established himself as handball's first superstar. His name was Al Banue. He'd travel around and with his brother and um, he would play the local champion and spot him 20 points. And then they'd make their bets. And he'd beat him 21-20. He was so great that a boxing promoter saw him and said, with those hands and with the speed of your hands and your ability, you should be a fighter. No. He also had a glass jaw. <laughs> well, Daddy had a boxing career, one boxing match. Some uh, promoter had talked him into being a boxer, and since he had the great athletic ability, and since it was the Depression, and he needed the money, he thought he would try it. it. It turns out that his temperament was good for handball, but not for boxing. He didn't like being hit, and I guess he took it personally, and he lost the match. Because of the AAU rules in every Brundage, he not only lost his uh, boxing career and the match, he also lost his handball career. When we speak of handball in New York at the time, it was one wall. It was just a front wall. If you lived in New York, handball was the national sport. You bought a five cent pinky ball and you used this ball wherever you went. You carried it with you. And you played ball against a, any building that you would find. Schools had teams. We used to play exhibition at night at Manhattan Beach when I started. Same with Brighton. Brighton Beach, we had a, an amphitheater that you'd see 2,000 people. And we used to have the place packed all the time. Like so many one-walled players before him, Vic Hershkowitz eventually graduated to the more widespread four-wall game. The national championships at that time were held under the auspices of the Amateur Athletic Union, where handball players rarely found funding or support. It was because of this that a wealthy 46-year-old home builder from Skokie, Illinois, took it upon himself to create an association that could address the needs of the players. His name was Robert W. Kendler. Before Bob Kendler came on the scene, it was controlled by the AAU. And the AAU treated it as a stepchild. Bob became uh, infatuated with handball, and when he formed the USHA, it really grew. He made all the innovations that we now enjoy. He standardized the courts from, uh, we used to plan courts that were anywhere from 25 to 50, wooden walls, wire mesh ceilings. He standard to 20 by 40, and that's where all the tournaments were played and everybody adjusted their courts accordingly. He would raise a tremendous amount of money to run a tournament and uh, he would uh, wine and dine these uh, players from all over the country and he would raise an, enough money so that he could have fantastic hospitality and I guess word of mouth got around and uh, people began coming to the tournament because it was a, a vacation to a great extent. The early years of the association also marked the emergence of one of handball's most revered figures. Jimmy Jacobs was handball's perfect poster boy. Charismatic, telegenic, and articulate, Jacobs was the ideal champion for the association's early years. And a picture of health so exemplary that a bodybuilding magazine did a photo spread on the young Jacobs' magnificent physique. It is apparent to the champ now that this kid Jacobs is built of steel bands. He just won't give an inch and never seems to tire. Jimmy is displaying a well-balanced all-around type of handball. He has two fine hands, a deadly kill shot, wonderful placements, the power to pass his opponent almost at will. And if you have never had to face his serves, you're lucky. 
It will hop a foot or more either way, and the ball is traveling like a bullet. And I really do think this guy was the most intelligent player we ever had. And he probably could have won without being that smart. The guy was blazing speed, and great strength, huge hooks. But he was also, I believe, the first guy to really make the game into a science. If you're, uh, if you're in a showdown uh, in the Old West and you're going to draw a gun, uh, if you start thinking of what's going to happen if you're shot, you'll never get into the showdown. So in a handball court, when you're playing against a viciously hard hitter, you don't permit yourself the luxury of thinking what's going to happen if he hits me in the head, because if you do, you'll never get in the court. The sentence that characterizes Jim the most, he genuinely cared for other people more than anyone else I've ever known. Bud Mielisen was probably the first big name as far as national champion uh, in racquetball. And at one point in 1972, I believe, Bud and I had a phone conversation. And he said, do you realize what would happen if I were to play you with my racket and you were to use your hands? And I said, yes, I do. You would lose badly. I said, where do you, where do you want to play? And in masses, my people came, his people came. We played the match in Memphis. And I lost the flip for the serve. And he hit the first serve. And I can honestly say, I didn't know what to do with it. I couldn't react to it, and I couldn't swing at it. The speed was incredible. I was ready for the best I knew I was ever going to see, but I wasn't ready for what he could do. And it took me 20 minutes to understand where to put my body to protect against this lightning bolt. And all through the second game, aside from physically having to play the guy, I went through about an hour and a half of having my mind rapidly teach my body what to do. I lost the first game and I won the second game. And in the third game, at, at near the end, I was in the lead 18-0 and for the first for the only time in a, in a very important match that I can ever remember I knew that I didn't have the strength left that my opponent had I knew I was I was on the edge it was, if it had gone five more minutes I wouldn't have won but um, it was very exciting and uh, all in all for the decade of the 70s it was very very good for for both sports. In 1973, after a quarter century of growth and prosperity, Bob Kendler established the first professional handball tour. While the format has changed over the years, the cornerstone of the Pro Tour has been an intense weekend of handball, showcasing its greatest athletes. The early years of the Pro Tour were dominated by Fred Lewis, who staked his claim as one of handball's all-time greats with six national singles titles. But even Lewis would eventually take a back seat to handball's brightest star, Nadi Alvarado. Played Nadi many, many times. Uh, lost to him many, many times. Was fortunate enough to defeat him a couple times. But on the whole, I feel that uh, he's probably the best player that I ever played against, maybe the best player of all time. Alvarado was blessed with an athletic grace, speed, and handball mentality that few players have ever known. From the late 1970s to the early 1990s, he won more pro handball tournaments by far than any other player. In addition, he holds handball's greatest record of all, 11 national singles titles. Nadi Alvarado arrived in the U.S. from Mexico as a teenager. By the time he was 21, he was earning a living from the game and was able, with his wife Lupe, to raise his son and daughters in style and comfort. Without Hembo, I probably wouldn't get up and do the things that I wanted to do so I could finish and start playing the game of Hembo and get in the court and just get the feeling of hitting the ball around the walls and play somebody and yes, to me, Hambo has been that way, and I'm thankful that every day, even now, as I'm retired, I still get up, can't wait to get in the Hambo court. 
Nottie retired from professional play in 1992, but his son, Nottie Jr., has now emerged as one of the tour's most exciting players. Well, you gotta help out your buddies. Ooh, what a move to get out of the way. He is so cat-like quick. Look at the speed. Watch him follow this ball around, keeping it in play. Sensational shot by Alvarado. So Nadi is in top condition at this point. But it made a big difference because now his mental attitude towards the game has changed. You know, I love that because he's been doing better because of the mental attitude. But the decade of the 90s belonged to a child prodigy on the verge of rewriting the record books. 25-year-old David Chapman with six national titles under his belt is ahead of schedule to break Nadi Alvarado's record. I asked him recently, I said, when, I, when somebody's shooting behind you off of the back wall, what do you look at? And I wanted to hear something like, I look at their feet, I, I look at their eyes, I, you know, I watch their hand against the ball. And He looked at me a little confused and said, well, everything. And he simply sees everything. He, it's very frustrating when he beats you to your shot. And I, I've been playing for, for about 16, 17 years now non-stop and going to all the tournaments, talking to all the great players, getting a lot of really good suggestions on how to improve my game, I think that really contributes to my success. The kid is a, a prodigy. You know, David does things, you know, that second before you even see it, he's done it or he's acting on it. And it's a little disheartening, you know, to see him. Uh, he's just got a gift that uh, I don't think can be taught. Oddly enough, handball's most well-rounded superstar doesn't play on the men's tour. Her name is Priscilla Shoemate, and she's the only woman player in history to win all three national titles, one wall, three wall, and four wall, in the same year. People are finding out how much fun it is to play the game. You can play it all year long. You can always find folks to play it. You can go from city to city, and you can always find a handball player to hang out with. And also when you move, you move from city to city and the handball community is always the first one to welcome you in. This exciting and challenging sport which had its American birth in the back of a saloon during San Francisco's Gold Rush era is today played indoors and out from coast to coast and recognized by players and fans the world over as the perfect game. As far as fitness and, and uh, enjoyment and athletic ability, I think it's one of the best games there is. Tell me where you're going to find another sport like that where you can have all these muscle groups really working and on top of it you have to think. You need to be able to throw, you need to be able to run, you need to be able to change direction, you need to have strength, you need to have flexibility, you need to have hand-eye coordination. Uh, handball is the only one that demands that you have all of those. Handball takes everything. It takes uh, smarts, it takes endurance, and it takes strength. Uh, top handball players are, are truly great, great athletes. I'm going to make another statement. I'm the only man alive in one wall handball that had an entire finals match replayed because of what, what took place involving a Sandler and a Carl Obert. For whatever the reason was, I didn't like the way the match ended. At that time, I was a Metropolitan handball champion. So I said to my friend, Mickey Blackman, this is no way to end the match. 
where one guy serves the ball and the other guy don't even want to retain the ball. So I walked over to Sandler after he won. I said, Steve, you'll have to do me a favor. You'll have to replay this match. He didn't say a word. He says, if you want me to, I will. I called up Eli Pickens from Texas. He was the head handball man, national chairman. And I told him of the AAU. I told him we got to replay the match. He says, under no circumstances do you ever do such a thing. The match is finished. That's the end of it. I want you to hear this whole story. I says, look, one wall handball is a different field. You have a four wall player. Over here, we'll have to replay the match because of one of the decisions, whatever it happens to be. I don't want to go into detail. It just didn't end right. There was a block ball called, and Carl Ober took it so much to heart, this was the final match, that he just couldn't get up to play anymore. Eli Pickens says, well, if you people here in Brooklyn think you want to replay the match, it's okay. Now, this is very interesting. So we agreed to play the match. I tried to get the referee to sign the papers to show what he did wrong. He refused. His name was Sam Silva. Jimmy Jacobs said to me, the Oberts aren't such good people, he says, that you got to replay the match. Many a time they walked off the court. I says, Jimmy, this is an entirely different story. I'm not familiar with the four wall out of town with the Oberts. Carl Obert is a gentleman. He never gave me a problem. I feel he's entitled to the match. Jimmy said to me, well, up to me, I give him nothing. Anyway, Saturday morning, a week later, Carl Obert walked on the court at 12 o'clock. This is in Coney Island. He walked over and thanked me, shook my hand and says, I thank you for going all out to get me to replay the match. That's the way the story no, was. No, no, no. You gotta say, who won the fight? No, no, no. Who won no, no, the fight? No. I hope you guys know handball, and I'm against them 100%. I'm, I'm sorry you brought that up because we'll have a battle over here. Now, if I played Sandler, me, and I'm going to beat him no matter by accident or what, now I can't beat him once in a million games, but if this day I'm going to beat him, don't take the game away from me. And this is what happened to Carl Obert. Carl Obert won the game. The referee called the block ball, which in my opinion wasn't a block. Another guy came over to the referee and said, why was it a block? Changed the call and called him out. Now, we know that Carl couldn't beat Sandler again. We know that. That one game, that one match, he, he beat him, and they took it away from him on account of a call. He beat him and, 62. I and how, to can, how could he be called that day? How, you say, you re, of course, Sandler played a rematch. He'll play him 10 the rematches. The score was 2018 at that particular sake. stage. Carl was serving. Carl the was not game. serving. He, he was serving. They called it. Don't. The I'm referee sorry. Sam Silver sorry. called black ball. Right. You're crossing the ball. Right. And one wall handball. That's an avoidable. No way. You, you, Mr. Lebisky went over to the guy and called him out. That guy called it a black ball, and that's I the way it should. Come on, let were arguing. I said to uh, Sam, "What good. was your reason for calling the block?" He said he crossed the ball. Leave me. I, let me talk, please. Yeah, I'll yeah. give you a chance. Yeah. I said, Sam, you know, when a man crosses the ball, he's out. Who, he said, why did you, for, you forgot I was on the short line. Why did you go over to him? Why not? I'm no, no, of, no, you're a short line. You're not, you're not the referee. You're one of your kids. And I, I yes, to listen to this. I, and I can't believe that Sandler would, because he was with me. 20 years or how much years later, recently, I asked him. I, I wouldn't believe he'd tell the truth. He said, the guy won the game. I was no block ball. I was shocked that he would, that Sandler would say something like That's that. It's not right. important there was no block ball. The referee called I the know, block. but why should he be called the ball. out? The guy was still serving. Because when you cross the ball, no, it's no, a handout. No, no, no. So Sandler got up. He went from 18 to 21 yeah. and right. won the match. Right. When they replayed the match yeah. the following week, <laughs> the scores were like 21-9, 21-12. Well, well. And that was the well, end of the story. Stuff. That was a long time. I don't. He knows you. He knows. Give him the day. Give him. The, he knows. That's 1967. <laughs> I was going to say about 30 years ago. Oh, we all. No, he argues. I don't. Well, we. Uh, yeah. They'll be arguing.